Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to read through to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening and there was a morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and then morning, the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They'll serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. There'll be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, Let the water swarm with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful. Multiply. And fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that crawl and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was... Very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to share with you uh, three books that I've used at various points, some less than others. Uh, we've got an outline on the inside of the newsletter and you can follow along there and there'll be some time for questions later on. Uh, but but let, me, let me share with you uh, three books. Uh, I'll go from the most used to the least used. Uh, the Norton Anthology of Poetry, the third edition. Had to buy this in first year English at Sydney Uni. Uh, it's a terrific book. Uh, it looks slightly boring, doesn't it? But it has examples of poetry from every genre and every age. 
a really great book to dip into with kids and adults as you look at poetry, which is what we Aussie blokes do often. Uh, and then uh, this other book that I bought in first year politics when I was studying international relations, looks even more exciting than the other one, doesn't it? Uh, the 20th Century World and International History. Uh, this has really been formative for me as I've tried to think about world politics. I still dip into it every now and again, uh, especially at various times as I'm trying to work out what's going on in the world, why do nations do the things they do. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes not. Uh, this book was given to us as a family, uh, Woodworking with Your Kids. Surprisingly, I haven't read as much of this one. But I aim to. Uh, it's got a number of activities, and one of my children was looking at it this morning and asked, Dad, why haven't we made that? There are a number of reasons for that. But they're all books on my bookshelf. But they're different, aren't they? You see, if I want to make something out of wood, Norton's anthology of poetry isn't going to be much help, is it? If I want to understand international politics, it might be similar to some forms of woodworking, especially stubborn wood, but that woodworking book isn't going to be much help, is it? And if I want to read about international politics, well, Norton's anthology isn't going to give me much, is it? You've got to understand a book if you're going to use it properly, don't you? You've got to understand a book if you're going to use it properly. And that's what we're doing in this sermon series. We're trying to understand this book. And it is one book, isn't it? We learned that last week. Uh, it's got two parts, Old and New Testament, 66 books, 39 in the Old, 26 in the New. It's got a number of authors, different types of literature, as we saw with my clothes on the clothesline last week. Not one author, one purpose. We're trying to work out how it all holds together. And we're using another book to help us do that. God's big picture, tracing the storyline of the Bible. Now, as we move into the second part of this series, let me reassure you of two things. The first is, I'm not preaching through this book. I'm preaching from this book. That's a really important distinction to make, isn't it? Because one of the things we want to do from up the front as we meet as the people of God is preach from which book? This book. But God's given us a number of very intelligent and capable people who write other books that help us understand it. Got to keep that order in mind. So we're going to preach through a passage each week. Uh, last week it was Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. This week, Genesis 1 and 2. And let me reassure you, secondly, that we're going to apply the Word of God. Because the God, Word of God must always be applied, mustn't it? That, that's its job. It's the most important book in the world. And so at the end of each sermon, even though we thought about how this big book holds together, we're going to think about how it applies to our own personal lives. Uh, last week, I reminded you just then that we've got that one book, 66 books, one author, God who uses a number of authors, a number of types of literature. I'm at point one on the outline, and it's got one purpose. God speaking to people about Jesus who deals with human sin. God speaking to people about Jesus who deals with human sin. And we saw what the theme of the Bible is and the the gentlemen on the overheads are going to click through two slides. That's one. So we saw last week, kids, if you're paying attention and you're a member from last week, it's not easy to read. We saw last week that the big theme of the Bible is what? Can anyone remember? Not a rhetorical question. The what? The kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is God's what? God's people in God's place under God's Rule and blessing. Thank you. So bring up that next slide, gentlemen. The kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Kids, that will help you fill out one of your activity sheets, the summary sheet, which we'll have every week. And so at the end of the sermon, I'm going to go to the summary of week two. And I want you to fill that out as we look at it together. Adults, if you need that summary sheet, come and see me later and I can run off a copy for you. Let me pray and we're going to go on to week two. Dear God, thanks for your word. Father, we are so familiar with Genesis 1 and 2 that perhaps there might have been an inward groan as we read them. But Father, help us not to be that familiar. Father, by your spirit, enliven us to delight in your word. Give us eyes by your spirit to see it, hearts that are softened to apply it, lives that are eager to live it as we look at your pattern for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, let me begin on that point too on the outline. Let me begin with archaeology. I don't know much about archaeology, uh, but I know this. It's the study of old stuff, isn't it? Archaeology is the study of old stuff, and it's usually old stuff you find by digging it out of the ground. That's right, isn't it? Uh, that's what the National Geographic Channel often shows. And they're very fascinated, these archaeologists, with old towns. Uh, I saw footage recently of a drone flying over an old town in England that they'd excavated and were looking at, and you could see the houses and the streets and even some of the places where they might have put tables, there's a bit of guesswork, and pots and all those kinds of things. Now, they don't spend months digging around those areas just to make a TV show, do they? They do it because they want to work out the pattern of life back then. Because if you can work that pattern out, you can then look at the world today with new eyes, can't you? They want to dig up the pattern so they can understand how the town worked, how things were, so we can understand how things are. Our world is a bit like an archaeological dig. There are layers and layers and layers of dirt on our world, aren't there? And I'm not talking environmentally. I'm talking about something called sin. There are layers and layers of rubbish which obscure our world. We feel it every day, don't we? There are layers and layers that we've got to get through if we're going to understand the original pattern. Now, we can look around this room and we can understand a little bit about a pattern. I mean, the room is full of people and there are two types of people. There are male and female. That hasn't changed, has it? And that actually tells us something about the world. But left to our own devices, we can't dig through all that rubbish for one very good reason. We're the ones who do the rubbish. We're the ones who've layered stuff over the world in such a way that we've broken the world. In fact, we've damaged it in such a way that we can't work out what it's like. We need someone to step in and reveal knowledge to us. Now, if you stop and think about that, that's how all knowledge works, isn't it? There is no knowledge we create. All knowledge is revealed, whether it's a scientific experiment, whether it's an observation in nature, whether it's seeing a pattern, and it's the same here. We need someone to step in and reveal the pattern to us. That's the purpose of that reading we had from Genesis. If you've got your Bibles there, uh, we see it very clearly even from the first verse. I'm at point three on the outline. Verse one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Wherever you look, who's there? God. He does everything. He does everything. He existed before all things were, were around. He wasn't made and nothing is made without him. He makes all things. The kids picked that up as they looked at that picture. And kids, I think you've got that picture there to colour in and to put Adam and Eve in. And he made all things by speaking. Did you pick up that rhythm? God said, there was, it was good, evening, morning, day X. God said, there was, evening, morning, day X. God said there was evening, morning. And when God made it, all of God made it. That's a really important fact to pick up. It's not as if God the Father said, hey, Spirit and Son, you hang there. I'm going to go and do something really important and then I'm going to come back and hang out with you guys. Now, all of God's there because that's really important when we get to verse 26. God the Father initiates it. The Spirit is there hovering. And by the time we get to Colossians 1, which we read today, we're reminded that Jesus is the one creating. And by the time we get to verse 26, we see God described as us. All of God is involved. And he establishes it in a pattern, in an order, doesn't he? Uh, have you ever uh, looked at a Jackson Pollock artwork? I mean, you might just glaze over when I mention art, but that's okay. Uh, Jackson Pollock artworks like this, you just get a big canvas and you throw paint at it. And then you step back and sell it to the National Art Gallery for $50 million. And there's no order. That's not the case with God when he comes to creating, when God is creative. It's got an order, doesn't it? Do you see kind relating to kind? He makes the superstructure. He makes all the big meta ideas and, and meta things and then he fills it with all the little stuff. 
with the land and the vegetation, with the clover and the bees and the flowers, and each thing's made according to its kind, and it's all good, isn't it? Do you notice I said all good? You see, our, our world loves to divide stuff. You know, spiritual stuff's good, physical stuff, that's a bit icky. Don't like that physical stuff. That's not the way God works, does it? God has physical and spiritual together. All good. God is concerned about all of it. God's kingdom is remarkably physical and as we'll find out over the next few weeks, remarkably spiritual. He makes the world and that means on your outline you see that God is the king of the world. God spoke it into existence and that means that when someone writes a poem like Psalm 95 that Pat read for us, For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hands. The mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Uh, You know how we work when we make stuff? Whose is it? That's mine. I decide how that works. Don't you put your fingers on that. God is a much better version, isn't he? It's mine. I made it. I'm the King. I'm in charge of it. That's really important because that means that God's not in a tree or a glass of water. God's not in a sunset or a sunrise. God is not in his creation because God made his creation. doesn't mean he's distant from it, but it doesn't mean he's in it. That's a really important fact in our world to grasp, isn't it? Especially with the language we use and the way in which we describe creation? Well, what does God deserve? Did you pick that up as Pat read? Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. What does God deserve? He deserves worship, doesn't he? We use that term often. What does it mean? It means giving God what he deserves. Giving God what he deserves. He made everything. What does he deserve? He deserves everything. Every facet and part of the universe is under God. Did you pick that up from Psalm 104? The young lions wait for God to set the dinner table. They starve if God doesn't provide. God made everything. God sustains it. Therefore, God is the king of it. Therefore, God deserves all of creation to say, you are the most significant thing around in all of the universe. That doesn't discount humans. And that's the next point on your outline. Humans are unique amongst all of creation. Again, our world doesn't like to say that. If you go back to ancient Greek philosophy, there was a debate about the essence of humanity. I can't remember whether it was Socrates or Plato, but they they described humans as a featherless biped. Another philosopher made fun of that philosopher by plucking a chicken and throwing it over the fence. That's a featherless biped, isn't it? It was not a human. So we're not an animal, are we? We're not amongst the animals in God's design. We're unique. Genesis 1 verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and femur. Did you notice that's the only time God deliberates in creation? At no other point does he stop and talk to himself. Here he does. He wants us to notice something. He wants us to pause and see that humans are unique. Nothing else in the world bears the image of God. Now, there's a lot of debate about that. It's certainly not physical. But you pick it up there, don't you, in verse 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. What does that mean? They will rule. And when God talks to them in verse 28, what does he tell them to do? Go and rule. Run the world under my authority, under my design. 
in the way I have set it up. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. And when all of that works together, when humans run the world for God, not instead of God, when humans run the world according to God's every kind, according to its kind, when humans run the world under God's kingship and word, what's the verdict there at the end of chapter 2? God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. Evening came, morning the sixth day. Now you'd think that would be a suitable pinnacle, don't you? I mean, if we finished at that, that would certainly feed our pride, wouldn't it? Humans at the pinnacle of creation. But there's another day, isn't there? Because rest is the goal of creation. That's what it talks about in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. So the heavens and the earth, everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he'd done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy for on it he rested from all his work of creation. doesn't have an end that seventh day. Did you notice that? There's no evening and morning. That's the climax. That's the thing that's meant to go on. God created humans to rule the world for him and by his word so that they could rest with him forever, be in his presence, reflect him, enjoy him, garden the world according to his gardening plan. And Genesis 2 explores that. Our movies have those two kind of shots, don't they? The, the drone shot where you get the overview and then the drone drops down and you see it from the perspective of the people in the movie. That's what Genesis 2 is about in one sense. Remember back at the start of the year, do you realise it's 12 months since we started looking at Genesis? Back at the start of the year we looked at Genesis 1 and 2 and we saw that God's name changes. The Lord God, the relational name. God makes Adam, verse 15 of chapter 2, puts Adam in the garden to work it, to care for it. Adam needs a helper, so he makes woman to help Adam. They're placed in the garden of Eden. He blesses them, he gives them an abundance, verse 16. You can eat from any tree, verse 17, just not that tree. Very clear word. And there are consequences. You will die if you don't do that. And then under God's creative purpose and design, Adam and Eve take care of creation as God intended. It's rest, the design, the pattern of God's rule and God's place. And so, gentlemen, up the back, if you want to bring up that next slide, kids, if you want to pay attention, this is your week two summary. Uh, in the what of the kingdom? In the pattern of the kingdom, God's people are who? It's not rhetorical. Adam and Eve, God's place is the Garden of Eden and God's rule is his word, his blessing is the perfect relationship that comes from that. Gentlemen, the next slide and that will put the answers up there. So kids, if you want to fill out your sheets, there it is. Week two summary, the pattern of God's kingdom. Now when an archaeologist has dug up a town, I mean, they've laid bare that pattern. They've often got to go back and rethink some of the stuff they think about the modern-day world. They've seen how things were done. They've understood how things have developed. And so they've got to look at the present world with new eyes. The original pattern helps them rethink the present world. No different here. So you'll see on your outline three implications and three applications those kids at year four and over will be listening because I think one of your questions is to write one of these down. And so here's an opportunity at point four on the outline to think through this. The first implication is very clear. There is one very simple truth. God is at the centre of the world. God is at the centre of the world. Sin is when I put I at the centre of the world. That's why the word sin is so helpful to remember what it is. I is in the middle. God existed before everything. God made everything. God rules everything. God deserves our worship. That's the pattern. God at the centre. Which leads to the second implication. Humans are created in the image of God to rest with God. 
Humans are created in the image of God to rest with God. One of the reasons that ancient Greek philosopher came up with that definition of humans, featherless biped, was he wanted to try and work out what our purpose was, what our meaning in life is. I mean, how fulfilling. I'm a featherless biped. That really gives purpose, doesn't it? Do you see how fruitless it is to work out your meaning and purpose in life if you forget the original pattern? We are God's gardeners. God made us in his image to rule the world under him. It's not as if God was worried about us getting bored so he had to give us something to do with our hands. God actually made us for that purpose, to work and rest in the same way, ruling the world under God in the pattern that he designed, which leads to your third implication. Where's the rest? Where's the rest? You see, that's the key problem with our world, a one way of understanding it, isn't it? There's no rest in this world. We are so frenetic, anxious, worried, because we cannot find rest. Now, if there's no rest, there's a problem because that's what we were made for. Something's happened to that pattern. Something's upset it. In fact, when you listen to Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, this is why Jesus came because there was no rest. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. H- hands up if you're weary and burdened. That's all of us, isn't it? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, we could stop the Bible at the end of Genesis 2 and still have a good analysis of our world, couldn't we? There is no rest. And Jesus came to do something about that. So let me draw out three very quick applications. You'll see them there on your outline. The first application is this. What is life all about? What is my purpose in existence? Let me be very blunt. It is very rare for me to sit down and talk to people about a funeral service and for them to be able to say, I have thought about the meaning of life. And yet here confronted by death, the very thing that gives them purpose is absent. What's the meaning of life? What's life all about? Well, the pattern says it very clearly, doesn't it? The meaning of life is to rest with God, to garden the world as God designed it. It poses us a question, is that what I'm doing? Is that what I'm doing? Which leads to the second application, what's the purpose of work? Did you notice that work is not a product of the world breaking? It's there in Genesis 2. 15, 16, and 17. God put Adam in the garden to work. And yet work doesn't serve me, I serve work. Does that sound familiar? My life is so frenetic because my work dominates me. My work helps me navigate a party or a social event. What's your name and what do you do? My work defines me. I analyse the world in terms of my work. My work fulfils me. Does that all sound a little familiar? Perhaps that suggests that we've got a wrong view of God and a wrong view of our purpose. Perhaps as we discover the original pattern, we can think better about not only rest but also work and we can think better, and this is the third application about who we are. Who are people? Much of the world will want us to think that we're no different to the rest of creation. We really are just featherless bipeds. But you are made in the image of God. Regardless of your skin colour, regardless of your education, regardless of your family situation, regardless of your employment history, Regardless of how last week has been, you bear the image of God. In a world that is anxious about self-worth, 
Isn't that the most worthwhile thing? We bear the image of God. God has said, I make you like me. That does so much remarkable work in the world, doesn't it? It removes discrimination. If we hold to Genesis 1 and 2, there can be no racism. It removes discrimination when it comes to work or whether someone's worth it. And it instills worth in anybody, doesn't it? However broken they may be, you are made in the image of God. Isn't that a marvellous pattern to have revealed? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this archaeological dig, this excavation, which has come by your revelation, not by our hands. Father, thank you that you've established this pattern of your people in your place under your rule and so enjoying the goodness of living in your design. Father, please help us to think through this, apply it, to analyse, to pray, to change. Father, thank you that you've revealed your pattern to us today. In Jesus' name, amen.